Um, now I will introduce Britta, um, who's going to be leading us off. Um, Britta, is the, Britta Olson is the watershed coordinator for the Lower Clark Fork Watershed Group, um, and she's been working for seven and a half years on restoration projects in the Bull River and other Lower Clark Fork tributaries, where reed canary grass has pretty much taken over a lot of the riparian areas, resulting in bank erosion, and it sounds like you all know, it sounds like everyone here knows something about reed canary grass, so I don't have to do um, um, and also just to note that um, Britta recently um, received a capacity support grant from the MWCC Watershed Fund to do a little more research into this using not only her hands-on experience, but also, you know, academic research um, and sort of developing a guide for best practices for um, revegetation and restoration efforts in the Bull, Bull River specifically, but as I'm sure you'll hear like applicable to other areas as well. Um, and so I really appreciate this was this was not a requirement of that grant. Um, Britta is just kindly doing this in addition, um, and I really appreciate it. Um, just getting the word out with some more information, and thanks so much for being here. So I will pass it off to Britta. All right, I will share my screen. Uh, hopefully, Zoom doesn't crash this time like it did the first time. <clears throat> there we go. Can everybody see that well? Not yet. There we go. All right. So, um, <laughs> yeah, like you Terry said, I've basically um, spent my entire career as a watershed coordinator um, with a huge focus of my time and energy on um, riparian planting projects in reed canary grass, um, mostly in the Bull River um, drainage. So this is a photo of the Bull River drainage. Um, it's uh, <laughs> an interesting thing about it is that um, you know, there used to be a lot of um, agricultural use and logging activities, but it's now transitioned and it's mostly um, enjoyed for its scenic, val you know, scenic values. Um, there's, um, you know, the private landowners in the bottomlands are, they're no longer relying on subsistence agriculture and there's a huge um, kind of conservation uh, kind of, there's a lot of conservation momentum in the Bull River Valley with, um, at, I think, a dozen uh, conservation easements on large parcels. Um, and there's only a few parcels that are over 40 acres remaining that aren't protected by conservation easements. Um, so it's a really cool um, area to invest a lot of those public resources um, because they'll be stewarded and protected over the long term. Um, so like I've been involved in these projects for um, seven and a half years, but the some of the projects and the lessons learned that I'll be talking about date back to some of the first projects that were ever implemented um, by, you know, restoration partners in the lower Clark Fork. It actually pre some of these projects predate the existence of the lower Clark Fork Watershed Group. Um, but I'm, you know, in the position where I get to help maintain those relationships with landowners and learn from those past projects and see kind of the full cycle of of how these projects come together and leave a lasting legacy on the landscape. So um, let's see if I can, there we go. So this is a, another view of the Bull River Valley. Um, I just wanted to give a caveat that um, with this, a, a reminder with a little red rectangle for me that um, Sometimes in talking about revegetation projects in a landscape that is full of various types of vegetation, it's a lot, there's a lot of green on green action, um, <laughs> and it's hard to tell. You know, I, I might I might show a photo, and sometimes it's really really obvious to me what it's uh, what it's demonstrating. But if you all are <laughs> confused about why I have a photo there and what you're supposed to be taking away from it, feel free to to pipe up and let me know or ask questions throughout anything. Um, another reason I like this photo is because it shows um, kind of the natural characteristic of the Bull River. Um, it's a, there's steep mountains on both sides of the valley, um, the Cabinet Mountain Wilderness on one side and a roadless area on the other side. Um, but the valley bottom of the Bull River is primarily a relatively low gradient meandering stream with, um, with naturally has a lot of streamside wetlands, um, beaver habitat, uh, and um, reed canary grass. Um, but his historically, you know, this this image that you're looking at right now showing the meandering river 
is gives you an idea of what the natural condition of the river is. But in a lot of places, the river has been um, straightened, straightened to varying degrees. The streamside wetlands um, historically were drained. Um, and when people homesteaded the valley, those wetlands um, were, you know, some historic do documents refer to it as natural meadows that created, you know, were good hay fields. Um, and then that was a lot of times draining wetlands um, and areas that weren't already treed. Um, so there's the condition that the Bull River is in right now. In some areas that the stream can meander naturally. In other areas, the, the stream's in a state of recovery from past um, agricultural uses and stream disturbances. Um, so I just want to, you know, I'm going to be talking about reed canary grass as a challenge, um, limiting diversity in riparian areas. Um, the way we got to where we are with reed canary grass is not um, just that like an invasive grass came in and invaded the entire valley bottom. There were a lot of disturbances and vegetation removal that created the optimum conditions for that reed canary grass invasion. So the the thing that we're doing to address and, and recover the system is establish is you know establishing woody vegetation where reed canary grass is, but it's not like a, a it's not a straightforward invasive species um invasion scenario where it's just trying to combat um the reed canary gas it's also just trying to like recover process um but we've had you know really good success in a lot of areas establishing mature vegetation here this is a spring photo so you don't see as much of the greenery but in pictured in this red um rectangle um there's some you know exclosures and cages um, or the remaining footprint of where there were cages, because we've now removed all the fencing around it, um, of where we, we have a mature alder and willow uh, stand along the Bull River. So um, why is reed canary grass a problem in riparian areas? Uh, one of the primary drivers in the Bull River for a lot of our funding is because um, the Bull River is impaired for um, sediment. And then the primary reason that it's impaired for sediment is, or the primary source of sediment is from bank erosion. Reed canary grass, um, when it exists in a monoculture along a stream bank, only has roots that go down maybe 12 to 18 inches max. Um, so when you've got a really deep river channel and you have one type of vegetation and the roots only go down 18 inches, there's a lot of opportunity for the bank to erode um, underneath. So the Bull River you know, erodes fairly continuously along the bank. Um, and then also when that those chunks of reed canary grass get undercut, just whole chunks of sod fall into the river. And in a lot of, you know, the river widens and the, the function of the river changes. So this photo shows that exposed raw bank, um, as well as the chunks of sod that fall in the river. Um, here's another um, kind of <laughs> poignant demonstration of the lack of root mass that goes all the way down um, to the stream bank. Um, and then this is a, these are more photos of indicating the the qualities that we actually want to have in our riparian areas. Um, so the Bull River um, Climax forest type is a Western red cedar um, forest. Um, it has a potential, you know, the, some of the largest trees I've ever seen in my life are in the Bull River. Um, they're huge, you know, huge Western red cedars. Um, and you know you can find some of them on private lands throughout the valley and 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 also in protected areas. Um, so there's there's a potential for a, a woody root structure on a on the stream bank that holds the bank intact, provides really good fish habitat under that undercut bank, and is less prone to erosion and you know more you know supportive of a, of a stream migration and erosive forces within kind of like a, a range of normal, um, whereas it's accelerated when those banks are dominated by reed canary grass. Um, and then furthermore, uh, reed canary grass is only one type of species and it only provide, you know, it's it doesn't provide a diverse habitat for all sorts of different fish and wildlife species. Um, so I, I like pointing out to people a lot that um, when you have diverse flowering species and diverse canopy heights, we're also um, you that's it's not it's not just about fish habitat it's also about why you know uh, you know somewhere that an undulate can rub or a bird can nest and in April if you go out to the banks of the Bull River and you find a willow bar 
Um, I've seen as many as like seven or eight different species of native bee on willow catnip, catkins, which are the first pollinating species that come out in the spring. Um, so by increasing the diversity of our riparian areas, we can address water quality issues, promote fish and wildlife ha habitat, and it's really the type of project that can raise all boats. Um, and there's a lot of different angles um, and, you know, funding wise. So the main limiting factor to get our uh, Bull River riparian areas back to a diverse, healthy riparian streamside area is reed canary grass. Um, it's invasive and ubiquitous throughout the Bull River, like many places around the country. Um, there is a lot of uh, kind of botanical debate about whether or not uh, reed canary grass is truly a non-native species, but there are genetic studies that indicate that um, well, we probably had a native variety of reed canary grass. There are European cultivars that have been um, hybridized or introduced in different uh, um, kind of different events. Um, and it's increasingly um, become invasive, um, particularly in areas um, post-disturbance. Um, and a lot of times it's post-agricultural disturbances. So um, like I have direct accounts um, from local landowners who remember their their you know fathers planting reed canary grass in the Bull River. It's been widely promoted by agricultural agencies such as the the um, NRCS or if the NRCS was a different had went by a different name in the 1940s. I'm not sure on the <laughs> the acronyms there. Um, and and it's still like reed canary grass seed is still sold all over the country and promoted as a quick growing grass um, that can prevent erosion um, and more in the probably in more like a, a road project or like an immediate following immediate disturbance. Um, and then one of the things that I found to be pretty interesting because it's just it's good to have a lot of these facts in the in the background because you get questions from landowners who move out to Montana from um, urban areas in California or Texas and they think that the Bull River is the most beautiful natural pristine area that they've ever experienced and it's hard to imagine that it might be disturbed because we don't have a sense of what that that historical condition was intuitively um, but they've done some really interesting studies of wetlands. Um, studying the sediment deposition of wetlands um, to try to identify what, you know, the vegetation communities going back historically. Um, and there's a Pacific Northwest wetland that's surrounded by reed canary grass that they've done a bunch of um, sampling and dating, carbon dating, that's indicated that reed canary grass only became dominant in that wetland following like agriculture agricultural disturbances in their surrounding areas. So we've got a lot of evidence that even like though it's everywhere and it might seem native, that there's been a vegetative change as a result of land uses. Um, so what we're left with is reed canary grass everywhere. And it's really typical of invasive species in that it puts a lot of energy into re reproducing um, via seed and vegetative growth. Um, as far as growth spread, there's two types of uh, two ways that grass can spread and uh, they either call it like the phalanx model um if you imagine like an army of soldiers walking forward in one line um or the gorilla model which is sends out big runners um uh, like four to five feet away um from where the the mat ex exists um it has a really long growing period so it's going to be one of the first grasses that starts growing in the spring and it has another um boost of uh, like kind of high, high growth, uh, even late in the season. Um, and it's still putting energy down into it, root, its root structure in the fall. Um, it grows incredibly rapidly. Um, so you, it, you know, dies back and mats down every spring, but then it can grow to be over six feet tall. Um, if the moisture conditions are right in different areas, it's very productive. And it's very, uh, you know, it can be very tolerant to different moisture contents in the soil, although there's a range and you end up seeing it sort of above where a sedge, uh, like a inundated sedge wetlands community might be. And then, you know, it still has to be in, in relatively moist soils. But there's a, in the Bull River, that's a really big, flat, meandering river. And all of the, like the majority of the soils are hydrologically 
connected in their fine sediments and they retain moisture in the in the valley bottom. Um, reed canary grass can basically take over the whole, you know, valley wall to valley wall. Um, so then if we're trying to plant in reed canary grass, um, it presents a lot of um, challenges. And generally what I've concluded and, and have been, you know, what's been reinforced by the research that I've done is that eradicating reed canary grass is generally unrealistic. Um, and, then, you know, from an ecological change standpoint, typically when you think about um, a degraded system, degradation occurs until it reaches a degraded degradation threshold um, where recovery becomes really, really difficult and it won't happen naturally. In the same way, when you, you know, when you're trying to turn, you know, move the ecosystem in a different way, restoration has to occur and you have to invest effort into it until you meet a recovery threshold. Um, and what we found with reed canary grass is that it, at minimum, will take five to seven years to get plants established, um, but probably longer. And a lot of, a lot of the projects that we're working on, um, I would say like we're still taking care of them and in ma maintenance mode. And it's only really at the 20 year mark where we have really well established trees and a lot of shade that's being produced that we can, can kind of phase out and consider that project complete. So this is a, it's a really long, um, intense effort over multiple decades. Um, other factors for reed canary grass is that it can be a relatively weak competitor for nutrients compared to native species, but it also responds readily to nutrient inputs. So if you can think about a disturbed agri agricultural environment that might get um, uh, fertilizer inputs, um, that, really as you know really promotes reed canary grass over native species um and then in the short term um when you have young when it's competing with young native plants it's a very strong competitor for light because of the growth characteristics that it had that it i talked about before where it can grow very quickly and get to six feet tall so it's really easy for it to shade out those those young seedlings around it um then there's also they call it the reed canary grass litter feedback loop where this reed canary grass grows to six feet tall every year, and then it mats down over the soil in um, in the fall and over the winter with the you know snow accumulations on top of it, and then that creates a thatch of grass um, over the top of the soil that prevents seeds from reaching mineral soil. So a lot of our native species, in order for them to germinate and get established, require a uh, seed having contact with bare mineral soil, um, and that's basically impossible in an area that is covered by a uh, monoculture of reed canary grass. Uh, so, you know, given all of that and the challenges that we face with reed canary grass, um, a lot of times in restoration, we think of restoring to a historical condition. Um, but in the Bull River Valley and in a lot of places, we're still going to be lim limited by the infrastructure expense, different species that we're, de we're dealing with, climate change, all sorts of different things like that. Um, so we're like we're never going to get back to the Bull River that didn't have a highway through it and didn't have subdivisions in the bottomlands and <laughs> and all of that. But in a lot of the areas, particularly summer where that that has long term protections and conservation easements, we can focus on restoring processes such as vegetation, like natural regeneration of native vegetation. Um, so. In our approach, um, we are trying. What we're trying to do is invade monocultures of these reed canary grass with native woody vegetation, um, and our goal is to eventually shade out the reed canary grass over broad enough areas that um, nat natural riparian succession can occur. So, in the past, we've you know some I I can show examples of this and talk about photos as I get further along, but we've um, you know, a lot of times our, our funding sources dry, you know, that, you know, say like we have a funding source, um, for that's meant to be improving water quality. Um, so we want to show direct benefits from our riparian planting to water quality or like a reduction in, in erosion. So we're incentivized in that framework of thinking to maybe like just plant trees, um, right along the streamside area over maybe like 20, you know, 20, 30 feet. But if we don't get, you know, I, I, one of the terms that has been used to describe this from comes from Franz Engelfinger up in the 
Kalispell, he calls that the hairy eyebrow technique of riparian vegetation, um, where we have just a narrow strip of, of vegetation that we're planting along a streamside area. But what we really have to do to be successful and to restore the process of natural succession is to broaden out that area so that we get a, a, a large area shaded by where the reed canary grass is um, suppressed that you know it's not you know anytime there's a disturbance it's not the primary thing that's filling that disturbance um, and one of the factors to keep in mind is like you can shade you know you can shade reed canary grass over a small area but if it's still open enough of a canopy that it's connected to an area in full sun um, by its tillers and um, kind of all the clonal structure in the soil, the all of the grass growing under that shade won't be affected at all by the shade because it sh it's sharing nutrients in this whole matrix of sod um, under the soil. So you really have to think broadly over the whole landscape um, and and really focus on that. You, you kind of, in, when you're planting effort, you have to imagine that, you know, 20, 30, 50, 80 years down the road, what is this forest going to look like? And you're like creating a forest, not um, just um, planting, you know, something in the short term. So one of the a good resources for kind of that sum, sums up a lot of um, research about reed canary grass is uh, the NRCS reed canary grass management guide. Um, there's a lot of different techniques that are proposed um, and are used to various effects like burning, excavating it, planting trees and shrubs like what we're doing, grazing, hang, mowing, er and use of herbicide. Um, I won't get into the like positive pros and cons of all of those, um, but I, you know, I address it a little bit in the revegetation plan that when I finalize it later this month, I can share with everyone. Um, but generally, um, the best long-term solution, particularly in the environment that we're working in the Bull River, um, where we're open to a vegetative sh change, is tree and shrub planting to shade out that reed canary grass and create a resilient, resilient riparian forest. Um, so this is uh, getting into some of the past work that we've done. So that this is a photo taken on a property that was, you know, revegetation efforts were started um, before before the Lower Clark Fork Watershed Group even existed. It's um, over a 20-year-old project now. Um, I think maybe this is one of the ones that Christine helped imp implement early on. She can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I know that she's participated in some of the, the, work, the original work on this property. Um, so in the this photo on the left is um, shortly after um, planting efforts commenced. And this photo on the right, um, I took this spring. Um, I'm the arrow on the right is connecting the two trees. <laughs> um, that that's the same tree in both photos. And what I'm pointing out in this circle is picturing. It's hard because it, you know brown and brown and tan. It's hard to tell what's really exciting about this photo, but it's that. Um, we have certain trees that are planted um, and they're the larger diameter tree on the right that was planted as a part of this, this revegetation project. But in the understory here, there's a bunch of stems that are coming out of the soil and that's all natural um, seedling regenerator. I think those are choke cherry seedlings that are regenerating in the understory of trees that were planted 20 years ago. So this is indicating to us we've successfully started that, you know, we've successfully implemented this re revegetation project because the riparian a area is sustaining itself and it's growing the next generation of trees that we didn't have to plant, which is the ideal that we want to get to. Um, so this is, um, you know, I'm going to be getting into some of what we've done in the past. Um, these photos kind of demonstrate one of the the first techniques that was implemented throughout the valley um, on a large scale we have um, and it consisted of laying mats of road bedding material or a large weed cloth you can see um, in this photo on the on the right the large rectangles that were placed on out on the riverbanks um, that's actually one of the first photos that I ever took um, when I was on a hike after shortly after getting hired for this position. I'm looking down and I realized like, oh, that's the project I'll be working on. Um, so 
this technique lays the weed ma weed matting down. They put it in place for two years. It composts all of the reed canary grass underneath it. Um, then it gets that large exclosure gets fenced and then the uh, plants are planted in that um, area. And this, it, <laughs> this technique, when we implemented it in the Bull River, um, largely produces the hairy eyebrow effect because it's um, it's expensive. It's a lot of materials and it, you know, usually is concentrated right in the riparian area, um, right, you know, well, it's all riparian area, but like right on the stream side, right, right on the river bank. Um, this photo on the left in the Bull River is taking the fall, the, the plants that are um, pictured in the, in the circles are the, um, let's see, like five-year-old vegetation that was planted in these large exclosures um, in 2016 or 2017. Um, so it's five-year-old vegetation. Um, you, and what you can see relative to the idea that um, we want to grow this vegetation over a really large area, um, we've established these trees, which is great. It's good to have more trees than not. But these trees by themselves aren't going to be enough to shade out that entire streamside area. Um, they're going to grow. They might live to maturity. We'll protect them from browse. But we really need to expand this effort even further if we actually want to reach that restoration threshold. So this is the technique that we're using more now. Um, you can see in the photo on the right, there's these stands of willow um, right on the riverbank. Um, those are in larger exclosure style planting, a really, you know, a big exclosure, mattings down, it composts the soil under it, we fence the whole area. Um, but then we're coming back to those sites, even though, you know, we already did a project at that property, um, kind of what we've learned and what we've seen now and the conditions that you need to promote in order to reach that restoration threshold is you, you need to grow those shading species over a larger area. So we're coming back and planting individual tree species um, throughout the whole floodplain area, kind of behind these plantings, so that as the river migrates, we have a mature forest that can create complex habitat and fish, you know, for fish and wildlife, and provide that stability to the system and that resilience um, behind it, as you know, for the next 100 years. Um, so this project on the left is um, work that we did this spring. Um, this project is, you know, again, that hairy eyebrow technique. Um, this was a large exclosures. This is the same area that was pictured in the first photo, of, you know, one of the first photos of my presentation of that kind of the aerial photo looking down. This is the same area of the stream bank um, now in the spring. So we can still achieve like a lot of value with that. But again, in the future, um, what we'll be proposing to the property owner on this, this, you know, at this site is that we expand these revenue Re these revegetation efforts outward um, and cover a, a larger area of the floodplain that's dominated by reed canary grass. Um, and now this is, I'm going to get into some of the challenges and some of this is going to, uh, it's fairly informal, but I just want to give you a, a, a sense of what the challenges are and some of the trade-offs between different techniques. Um, this, what's pictured here in the red is a clump of trees that were planted um, so like 15 years ago um, as a part of um, the like the a large exclosure, and at the ten year mark, we started removing all of that fencing, and uh, what we immediately encountered removing the fencing was heavy beaver brows. brows. So this photo of uh, just completely clipped down alder, um, I took uh, one hour after we removed the fencing around this exclosure. Um, so we we removed all of the fencing. I was working with NMCC crew, took a break for lunch, and then we came back and heard the like the flap of a beaver uh, jumping in the water and found a fresh true uh, a fresh chew. So one of the things that we have to be really you know <laughs> think about you know beavers are a part of the landscape. Um, they're one of the wildlife species that benefits from riparian vegetation, particularly things like alder and willow and dogwood but they like I've seen them chew every single species that grows in the riparian areas on the Bull River um, so it, you know if you think oh well like this you know this species is as beaver resistant or they don't like it 
no, sometimes they just will chew on anything. Like <laughs> so I whether it's a, a mature hawthorn tree or a blue uh Engelman spruce, um, they they are not just chewing on the willows out there. So um one of the things that we have to think about over the long term for growing a riparian forest is that even after we grow some, you know, grow a tree and it's 10, 20 feet tall, there's still that pressure um, from wildlife to um, to utilize that vegetation. So a lot of times we think like, oh, well, once it's over 10 feet, we can take the browse protection off. That might be true for a willow stand that's going to be stimulated by beaver browse and then just grow back bigger and stronger. But um, if we want to grow a tree that lives for 200 years and becomes a like beautiful mature western red cedar on the stream bank we need to be thinking about long-term protection or you know beyond that like planting so many trees that the beaver cannot chew them all because when we just plant a few at the time we're, we're essentially just planting a salad bar um another consideration in those large exclosures where we put large mats of fabric down um right on the stream bank is that um, although reed canary grass is not the best protection from erosion, it is the only protection from erosion that these things have. And when you put a mat of fabric down too close to the stream and we already have accelerated erosion occurring, um, that mat completely composts the reed canary grass underneath it over a 15 foot section near a streamside area. And it can sometimes in the short term actually make that area more prone to erosion because you remove what little um, what little vegetation on the bank is remaining and you're well, you're still trying to establish that willow stand. So this is showing um, a, now, now an area of raw bank that is immediately behind, you know, the, what's on the surface of the soil right there is a, a weed mat. Um, and although we have the, these willows established, um, it's still in the short term of this project, we've started, we've actually accelerated some erosion, um, which might, you know, in the grand scheme of the river, probably not a big deal for this one area, but different partners and in different locations could be really sensitive to that because if we're um, planting vegetation on, say, like a critical bull trout stream that they're concerned about any sediment inputs affecting, you know, fish spawning, we want we want to be we want to feel confident in our projects that we're not going to have um, short term negative effects, um, you know, particularly to those sensitive species. Um, and another challenge that we face with those large exclosures um, is that um, they are not impervious to wildlife, um, <laughs> and it's you know it's pretty difficult to build a fence that beaver can't get through or other wildlife can't disturb, particularly when you're putting T-posts in saturated soils in a riparian area. So this, um, this, you know, these collection of photos demonstrate that even when there's not, um, like on the right, we didn't even have this exclosure planted yet. Um, we just had matting down and we just built the fence and there is a, this, this hole was already, pulled apart um, in the one-year-old fencing by probably a beaver. That's my my guess, that they're just like curious. So they tore the fencing apart and went and checked out inside the, the fencing. <laughs> um, and, you know, so they're incentivized. If you th imagine them, you know, a, a critter being incentivized, like in year one, following, you know, installing this fencing, and there's no vegetation in them there. Imagine how incentivized they are when there's a fresh like salad bar that's, you know, beautifully three years old for them ready to eat. Um, so on the left here is another way that beaver can get into these exclosures, which is just digging under the fencing. And there's only some, it's already like very laborious, you know, or laborious or whatever the word is um, to install all of these large exclosures on the landscape. And there's only so much more that you can do to protect it or or make it more um beaver resistant. And so this in this case, the beaver just dug under the fencing um and then chewed every stem inside of the exclosure. Um so one of the 
the results of this is that, you know, with in the short term, it seems really efficient to build a large exclosure, but it also leaves all of your eggs in one basket um, and is more inviting than having to get through one hoop of fencing for one tree. Um, another um, factor here is so with with the large mats of fatting, matting, you cut a hole in it, plant the tree. Um, and now this is a 10 to 15 year old project that we were working on this summer. We have a small, you know, the tree originally when it was a tiny seedling um, was planted in just a, a small little hole in the matting. And, you know, now it's, it's growing and is 15, uh, at least 15 feet tall. And what we're having to do is try to you know, make sure that we go to every single tree that was planted, um, dig down around at the base of the tree, find the matting and cut it away. Because even just in just in 10 years, that small hole is now girdling this tree. And if we don't get to it, eventually the tree is just going to die because of what we originally put on the landscape to protect it. And now in a, in a lot of places, we just want to be removing the matting altogether. Um, but we'll get to how challenging that can be. So this is this is a um, photo of myself um, following, we're in the midst of four hours spent removing the matting that was laid on one exclosure on a property. Um, so that was me working with three different MCC crew members for an entire afternoon. Um, and it took us that long to remove probably a 15 by 30 foot area of all of the matting that had been da laid down um, so that it's you can see this pile of matting back behind me that we we all had, you know, pu we're pulling off the soil. And it's it seems like it would be easy because it, you know, it suppresses the reed canary grass and you grow the trees. So there's like there's nothing on the bottom. You just pull the matting off. Um, but it's been, you know, embedded in the soil for 10 to 20 years. And then this mat of grass that I'm holding up um, was three, it was like three feet of reed canary grass encroachment from the, the edge of the exclosure growing over the matting. Um, so so we were, we were having to like extract the sod and just try to get that matting up, which is, and it's really important for us to get that matting up because if we, over the long term, as these trees around us mature, you need, you know, you have to pull that barrier out so that that natural succession can actually happen. Um, hey, so hey, this, Anna, this, I, I don't want to, I know you have a ton of great information. I just want to make sure we leave a little time for people to ask questions. So yeah, just letting you know. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is one of the last like photos that I have that I'll just talk about is we have, you know, this is the pile of matting um, with the contrast of the technique that we use um, with an individual hoop on my crew removing it. Um, and then I can, I don't have to get into these, um, but this just gets into some of the more details where I wrote out what the different comparisons of the different things are. You know, this is a cost comparison and, and Terry can send this um, out at the end of the presentation, but I just kind of wrote a summary. This is how we install those exclosures. Um, and this is after the long term, um, those trees growing up. So this is a four year old planting and I have a cedar tree that's already above my head. Um, and this is a 20 year cedar planting that's very well established that we're still protecting. Um, so it's just cool to see this project coming now um, where we're starting to see that growth of those trees and demonstrate that our individual planting technique um, can really be successful over the long term. So then we can chat further and I can answer any questions. Or I can go back if nobody has any questions. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. No, it was so, such good information. And like, I don't know if you want to stop screen sharing for a minute, and then we can go back if we need to. Um, because yeah, maybe people will have questions about those specific numbers on those slides. Um, yeah, that's such great information, especially like the you know all the things that that didn't work or that you had to modify after. It's just really great to see like that honesty and, <laughs> and how hard this really is. Um, so thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, and yeah, if people, I will definitely share out those slides and maybe people will want to go back to them now. Um, so yeah, just opening it up for questions. But I would love it if you would walk through the, the steps of the, the individual planting, like, you know, what you're doing for sod removal and, and that kind of thing in order to, to get those individuals established. Okay, <laughs> totally. I can, I'll, I'm going to reshare really, really quick. 
So um, this is so it's a kind of a multi-step pro process. When we do the large exclosures, you lay the matting down for two years and build a fencing around it. But when we do individual plantings, we can do it all just in one season. So it's a shorter implementation time, which is a lot easier to fund because a lot of our funding sources are available. You know, you end up with by the time contracting is done, you end up having nine months to implement a project under a one year grant um, or um, or just one season to implement under a one year grant. And it's it's easier to be able to show that you've you've completed the implementation of a project and, and to get it funded because it's you don't have to rely on people taking uh, making a three year long investment in a project or a five year long investment in a project. Um, so we do. I, I like doing most of our implementation in the spring. It tends to be a lot easier. So on the left, um, this is a planting area that we've prepared. Um, it you can't really tell super well, but we've gone through in a three by three foot area with typically a pickmatic um, or a Pulaski, um, the matic side of a Pulaski, and we scalp and pull like kind of scalp the soil and pull the reed canary grass sod or rhizomatous mat off the soil in a three by three foot area. So you're we're basically um, removing that sod layer so that we have a three foot area of kind of mineral planting soil. And then we, you know, dig, dig our hole to plant the tree in the middle of that. Um, and then that in itself reduces a lot of the direct competition from reed canary grass around the seedling where it's when it's most young and vulnerable. Um, we still then lay a four foot um, weed matting down um, and one of the things that you you might not be able to tell from this photo very well is that we, we lay that weed matting down, but we have, it's not just a hole in the center of the matting, it's a slit all of the way to the edge of the matting that's slightly overlapped and, and stapled at the, using landscape stapled, stapled at the edge. So that's kind of a, a backup. If any of these plantings are forgotten or missed on the landscape um, for 15 years, um, that matting is not so tight around the tree that it will get girdled in the first 10 to 15 years. Um, and then, um, so you, you can kind of see that that planting area, it's a little bit more obvious um, in this bottom photo. Um, and then we had used one T post um, set off from the plant about 18, uh, you know, 18 inches, one foot to one and a half feet off the plant. Um, we use 10 feet of welded wire, uh, 14 gauge fencing in a hoop around the planting fixed to the T post with T clips and then wrapped around. And then we hit staple that the opposite side of it, um, which I also can share in writing <laughs> for anyone who's interested. Well, and pretty is this, this is going to be in that planting guide to these more detailed. Yep. So yep. When, when that comes out, we'll help we'll share that out or yeah yeah and we uh we did also get funding um well we were tentatively tentatively approved for 319 funding to um plant another 1500 trees over the next three years in the bull river um as and you know we so, have some other pending funding requests out there but one of the outreach projects that we will have over the next year or two when that funding is in place is a couple more films about Bull River revegetation efforts, one of which will be like a a planting demonstration that shows in detail, exhaustively everything that it takes to do one of these plantings. Um, so we'll hopefully have that in the next year or two. Great, and it looks like Shane has a question too. Um, pertaining to the 1500 trees you have over the the next three years and the 318 funding, what kind of acreage does that cover? Um, I'll go back. Here we go. Um, so I, the way that I calculate the acreage that that covers is based on um, what I typically use is a 16 foot spacing um, uh, circle calculation. So it's about 200 square feet. So you can do you know, like we've done 900 square feet um, or we've, sorry, we've done 900 trees in the last couple of years at a 200 square foot feet spacing. That's four acres. 
so you i just use that you know variably depending on how many trees that we're planting um i i base my tree spacing um uh, kind of like stock assignments per property based on the acreage broken down to the 200 square feet circle if that addresses it so it and then like Thank this you. slide is just kind of comparing the ultimate square feet that you get out of one 15 by 30 foot exposure to the you know the area that you area of canopy cover you get out of individual plantings um and then on above i you know what we can share is the cost per materials to install five individual plantings versus the cost per one exclosure to install uh, you know to end up with the ultimate outcome of four to five trees That. what size plants are you using and have you found that that makes a difference um so my my preferred size plant is a um oh, i forget the number um it's spacing me i think it's like um it's the largest stock that the dnrc conservation seedling nursery in missoula sells um they're about a three by three square at the top and like a foot tall. Um, and they end up being, when they arrive, they, some of them, they're range from like 18 inches to like a couple feet tall. They're like fairly robust sizable plants. Um, and they, they used to cost only $8, which is how much they cost when I started using them. But the price just went up to $14 per tree. Um, so it ends up, you know, it's, they're definitely expensive, um, but I've seen um, that they have, like, we've had <laughs> really, really high survival rates when we plant those. And if you think about, you know, the cost of putting 10 feet of fencing, one T-post, a weed matting, um, seven landscaping staples, and the labor that it takes to scalp the soil and then plant the tree and install everything, um, it you know, it's, I think it's worth the investment in high quality planting stock um, based on the loving treatment that we're giving all of these little plants. Um, but at the same time, we've, I've also planted the uh, like $2 nursery stock from the conservation seedling nursery or the U of I um, Pitkin nursery or excess stock that I can get through the forest service Coeur d'Alene nursery. And all of them with the individual planting method have seen relatively good survival. There's just a, there's a little bit more mortality that we see with the really smaller stock. Um, and then, but then we also feel like more of an impetus in the first year when the trees are really young to go and do like pull the grass away from the cages and, you know, take care of them because the, the tree stock just isn't as robust. Looks like we've got a question from Connor too. Uh, Britta, um, what kind of weed mat are you using? And you have you experimented with any biodegradable weed mats? Um, we have not. So ours is usually it's a most of it has been a geotextile. Actually, actually, I ordered weed mat for the first time last year. Um, so the jury is still out on the stuff that I ordered. Um, okay. because I from the original project that we had, we had multiple roads of like multiple huge rolls of the geo like geotextile roadbed material um mm -hmm. that we then cut down like it was it, fairly labor intensive but we cut it all down into the squares so that we could use them on our plantings it's worked really really well on reed canary grass um and it it does it provides the weed barrier that we need and when you have the four foot square around a tree you know it's there and it's easy to find it and you can pull it out and it's usually intact enough that when you want to remove it you can you can you actually can remove it without it disintegrating mm -hmm. um so we i i would tend to enjoy, like like that style um but one of the challenges with the biodegradable type is reed canary grass is really aggressive and can grow through a lot of things and so it would end up you know when i've priced things out the biodegradable types tend to be way more expensive or way more labor and logistically just very challenging like you if like maybe we could try cardboard but then like the logistics of sourcing the cardboard removing plastic from the cardboard and then 
just getting them out to the site is just not, it's not feasible in the environment that we're working in. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah, yeah I hate to, we're a little short on time, but I, I mean, obviously more, more questions, but also I didn't know if anybody else had any experience. I mean, I, yeah, Britta, you've just done so much work in this area, but. um. Yeah, yeah. well, and if people want to have questions and want to stay around, I'm happy to stay on for longer too. Um, no pressure. Good to know. Why well, I, I actually do have to leave after at one, but um, but if it, I, mean, I could, you are a co-host. I think I <laughs> people want. I can end the meeting on my own <laughs> timeline. So if that's okay, yeah. But anyway, if we do have a few more minutes. Additional questions, comments, other experiences. Is I, I was going back to the biodegradable piece, Connor. Did you have other materials in mind? I mean, cardboard's the one I've heard of. But are there other materials on the market that you guys have looked at? Yeah, no, just just cardboard. Um, I mean, most of the projects that that I've done, we use just the normal weed mat. We didn't use the biodegradable stuff for similar reasons that Britta was talking about. Um, but I had seen some projects where they had a really good source for cardboard. And um, I watched those presentations like a few years ago. I haven't seen how they've gone since then. But I knew there was like some some people in like uh, in like Western Washington that were using, that had a really good cardboard source, like from a cardboard production facility that was like just giving it to them um, for really inexpensive. And they were, they were using that, but I don't know how long it lasted. Um, I used it at like our house. We had like a teeny Creek that went through our backyard and, and we used cardboard, which seemed to work fine, but um, uh, I didn't cage everything and the wind would rip those things off. So I think the cages definitely help uh, keep things down. So. Yeah, I have heard of up in the Thompson River, they experimented a little bit with um, a heavy mulch layer. And I know in some, I've watched some presentations from Western Washington where they have a source for wood chips and they just get dump truck loads of wood mulch delivered. Um, one of the challenges, so a challenge they had in the Thompson River is the they installed it all. They were very enthusiastic about it. And then the first year afterwards, it uh, w washed away in the runoff. Um over i think so if you are in a flood prone area it's a challenge um over in w western washington they say they they haven't dealt with that but they're probably planting in areas that aren't completely inundated or have a lower stream power for the flood flows yeah makes sense and i saw um i was just saying it, oh, oh, it just looked like gunner had unmuted and maybe was trying to say something too and hadn't spoken yet go ahead I have a question on what your more mature restorations, what the understory look like, and what, since um, you know eradication isn't necessarily the main goal, what is your acceptable level or coverage of re canary grass in a particular restoration area? So I I would say like eradication isn't the main goal on the larger landscape because it's not feasible, but where we're doing these stream restoration projects, our goal is to have it largely um, not present in the understory. Um, like, so I would say like, we want it to be at low enough densities that in the understory, there's more diversity of different um, forb species and like typical understory species and mineral soil. So, um, on those older like 20 year projects where we've in the areas that we've gotten all of the matting removed and um it's you know the understory is fairly well shaded there's an accumulation of leaf litter that's mulch and then in areas you know i'm seeing at this point they're just like six inch dug fir and western red cedar seedlings or you know, two foot tall choke cherry seedlings. Not all, of, but not of all of them are going to survive because they're growing in the understory of other trees. Um, but we're seeing that natural generation occurring. So, and there's limited reed canary grass to such an extent that I have full confidence in some of those areas that you know one of the mature trees falls, the species that will origin like immediately rise to dominance is probably going to be those already established conifer seedlings or choke cherry or um, other native sh shrubs and not just a reinvasion of reed canary grass. So that's not very quantifiable, but that's uh, <laughs> kind of the 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 gut plan that I have. And I'll 
yeah, I'll just hop in to say, I just put the information in the chat so I can get going. Um, I guess I will leave this open. It's, I don't want Britta to feel pressured to stay on or anybody to stay pressured to stay on any longer than they, um, than they intended to. Um, but I'll leave it open in case you all want to continue talking. I just drop the next information in the chat. Um, thank you so much, Britta. This was such an informative presentation and um, thanks everybody for being here and contributing your own questions and ideas. And I will leave and we should stay on because Britta's the host now. So <laughs> bye. Thanks, Terry.